Well, thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Terry and, and co-organizers for organizing this important meeting and uh, for Dr. Shear and Chung for doing such a uh, beautiful job at setting the platform uh, and basis for our discussions today. Uh, I would uh, see my task over the next uh, 25 minutes or so really to frame what's already been discussed and maybe provoke you in a way to really think deeply about what we can do here and um, what, what is the way forward. So if we had our wish list about the SJSTN five-year vision, what, what would that be? I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, we'd be able to understand the immunopathogenesis, and this would probably provide a roadmap, not just for SJSTN, but other immune and inflammatory diseases. We'd like to have a solid prediction and prevention program that is actually not only, uh, not only published, but actually effective in clinical practice. And we'd like to be able to measure decreases in morbidity and mortality associated with not only the human mortality, but the death of drugs. Um, and, and clearly, um, having a robust global pharmacosurveillance and collaborative networks is something that really the time is right to build this. And I, I say last and not least, because this has come up, I think, uh, already in the discussion, education is extremely important and nothing really happens globally without appropriate education. And all of us in the room that work in the ADR space know that not enough space is dedicated to ADRs in medical school, in undergraduate science programs, and we deal with physicians that are in clinical practice that don't understand ADRs, they don't recognize ADRs, and they just haven't had enough background in ADRs, and SJS and TN is no exception to that. So we need to have better mechanisms for actually disseminating information uh, to, uh, to providers. So what are the unmet needs uh, currently? Um, and I'm going to go through these uh, in, in, in some detail. But we've already heard the problems of actually, even though this is a very dramatic disease about defining the phenotype and immunophenotype, but importantly, being able to assign causality of a specific drug. We've heard that it's very important to be able to collect samples and DNA and biological samples on these patients, but this is something that's still in its infancy and we need collaborative networks that are representative across ethnicities, um, pharmacogenomic studies. Uh, there are some challenges regarding those and I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, when Hung and, and, and Neil have, have really nicely outlined the immunopathogenesis of this disease, but there's much more to be done, again, that can give us broad insights across uh, hypersensitivity. And then there's issues with regards to management, prediction, and prevention. And uh, above and beyond all of that, really, to make any of this happen, there needs to be huge, huge capacity building. So challenge number one, defining the population. I've already mentioned that education of providers is important because people are not reporting these diseases, they're not recognizing them potentially. Pharmacosurveillance has a reporting bias and is incomplete and often has been driven by industry reporting of newer drugs and many of the older drugs um, in FDA and other databases may be underrepresented. Uh, there's, there's problems with the way we code reactions, and this is going to be talked about later today, but clearly the coding systems in electronic medical records and, and records in general, they're not geared towards identifying diseases such as SJST, and they lack sensitivity and they lack specificity, and they're just overall pretty lousy. Um, there's huge challenges in retrospective causality uh, assessment. Um, and an enormous amount of infrastructure is needed when you're studying less common diseases to build these uh, collaborative networks. Um, and this is a paper actually that was published by, uh, by, by Neil's group now some time ago, really to crystallize there's this huge gap in, in terms of actually what's actually reported in terms of pharmacosurveillance and what is actually occurring. So this was actually um, comparing uh, cases, actually surveying burn units across Canada, and 14, I think, of them actually responded. So only 64% responded, but there was still a huge gap identified between the number of TEN cases that could be identified from burn unit reporting over a five-year period versus what was in the uh, equivalent of the FAERS database in, in Canada, the CADR 
MP, and so really it was only capturing at best 10%, and if you actually looked at a hospital discharge database, this would go down to actually only 4%, realizing that the ICD-9 codes are so terrible that that was not going to be a, a good representation. So underreporting is, is a serious problem. If we look in FAIRS uh, uh, more recently, and I, 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 I thank um, the FDA for, for providing um, this data, but you can see I would only make a couple of points here. I mean, many of the culprits here are the ones we're expecting to see. Uh, but then, you know, under uh, uh, number six, we see acetaminophen. So what's going on there? I mean, who, who in the room believes that acetaminophen is the number six cause of, F, of, of toxic epidermal necrolysis? Does anyone really believe that? So what, what happens in these databases is they're very important for culling data, but they're not uh, sensitive or specific enough to, to look at causality. And you can imagine a disease like uh, SJSTN, which we've already heard, has profound systemic and constitutional features like fever. Patients are going to get prescribed a lot of acetaminophen in the early stages of that, maybe even before the spots come out. So it's this propathic effect that we're seeing with acetaminophen, even though there may be a tiny number that are actually uh, real cases. Um, and then if we actually look at formal causality algorithms, which have actually been developed, uh, we can see a number of things stand out. And this is actually a, a causality assessment called the ALDEN score, which was developed by the uh, uh, Euroscar group that, uh, that really hones in on, a, on some key features of SJSTEN. Um, and why do we need a specific score for SJSTEN? Well, first of all, if you look at the delay from the initial uh, drug uh, dosing, it tends to be much shorter for SJSTN than other types of, uh, or many other types of immunologically mediated drug reactions like DRESS. Um, and this causality takes that into account. So most of SJSTN will occur within a four to 28 day window. And if it's significantly outside of that, um, then you start to wonder, and the drug is not a drug that is, has been associated with SJSTN. Um, as outlined here in terms of actually the likelihood of the drug uh, present, uh, then you really would start to think that this is not going to be a probable or likely reaction. These types of things like de-challenge, re-challenge, they can often be hard to measure and they may be predicated on things like the half-life of a drug. So if you have a very long half-life drug like nevirapine, someone gets toxic epidermal necrolysis, the D-challenge uh, may, not, may not be that useful in that case because the, the horse is out of the barn, essentially. Um, just to make a couple of points about reporting and, and pharmacovigilance as well, this is actually from the uh, uh, Canadian Adverse Drug Reaction Database. This is actually a, a, a sample of the report that exists. And I would just make the point that in some cases it can be very challenging. I mean, look, this is a patient that was reported to have uh, uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis, but there is three suspect drugs, and all of those, Bactrim, Dilantin, Phenobarbital, all of those are drugs that actually could cause toxic epidermal necrolysis. And in terms of the duration of therapy, it's probably a, a little bit short for Bactrim, but look, I mean, it's really within the window period that you can see. So there are complex cases where from a date, from a a pharmacosurveillance uh, alone and from an ADR database, we won't be able to tell with precision drug causality. Here's another case where there's two suspect drugs, uh, um, Advil and clindamycin, but you can see the Advil had been taken and perhaps off and on for almost a year, whereas the clindamycin was more recently prescribed, but they're both listed in, as being suspect drugs, and we would obviously have a very low suspicion for the involvement of ibuprofen here. So just to move forward in terms of uh, uh, the second challenge, in terms of biological samples, again, along the lines of what I've previously said, robust phenotyping is needed because we need to make, if we're actually ascertaining drug causality and looking for uh, immunopathogenetic and, and uh, pharmacogenomic studies, we need to actually have robust phenotyping and causality assessments. So this could include, for instance, uh, not only the clinical phenotype, but an immunophenotype. So some in vitro, in ex vivo or in vivo measure that there actually is an association uh, with that drug. Uh, 
Uh, there's also f currently few examples of electronic health records paired with biological samples, although that's growing, and, and Josh Denny uh, from Vanderbilt is going to talk about that uh, a bit later. Uh, but we need to actually be prepared uh, to help well-crafted sources, because often, so often, you get just very valuable cases and material, and if you're not, at, it's very hard to get this material retrospectively or to look at things as to what happens with drug responses over time. So paired samples, time samples, tissue-specific samples, those are all important. And, and the very nice data that Wen Hung showed is that these, these um, responses, these uh, T-cell responses in SJSTN are largely tissue-specific. And so the actual uh, TCR repertoire, the T-cell receptor repertoire that you see in blister fluid is actually going to be very richly representative of the immunopathogenesis that in PBMCs 20 years down the track may not be so. So getting the appropriate samples early is very important. Uh, in terms of pharmacogenomic studies, again, we need ro robust phenotyping, um, but, but not just robust phenotyping, appropriate reference and control populations. And, I think what this actually is, is becoming less clear over time with population admixture. Um, what actually is the appropriate reference and control population and how do we define race? And I think there's a lot of now discussion back and forth about that doing genetic pharmacogenomic studies. There are other ways of defining race other than self-identified race. And these are probably going to be more precise and more precise markers of actually defining the appropriate race uh, match control populations and actually simply a, a large uh, reference population which can give founder effects, especially when you're only dealing with a small number of patients with a given disease like SJSTEN. Um, and pharmacogenomic studies also ideally should provide a, a robust ro roadmap for translation as well as providing a platform for understanding immunopathogenesis. Um, and I show this slide, this is an old slide with only two digit HLA typing, but really just to give you a feel that many of the actual uh, HLA, uh, HLA zero types actually exist all over the world, but there are, there, but the diseases that we see that are HLA restricted are going to be driven by the population prevalence of this. So you've already seen with B1502 and B5801 that allopurinol and carbamazepine uh, SJSTN are prevalent in, in Taiwan, uh, but, uh, but those HLA-restricted uh, diseases, not so much in North America, and Abacavir in the association with B5701 would be an example of a Caucasian, uh, largely Caucasian disease. Um, and the other issue with pharmacogenomic studies that's very important, and I think this came up in the initial question period, is how many cases do we actually need to establish risk? If we've got a disease like SJSTN, uh, that, is, that is uncommon, but the, the effects tend to be profound and the odds ratios tend to be high. How many actual cases against a uh, control population would be need to define an effect? And this is actually nicely showing you from the studies that have already been published that these diseases that have high odds ratios, like abacavir, allopurinol, and carbamazepine, that actually the numbers needed are reasonably small to identify an effect. In fact, with abacavir, there was actually 15, a, a total of 15 cases uh, against a population of 200 controls that were actually needed to define with high odds ratios a very strong association with B5701 and a back of your hypersensitivity. In terms of actually common, common themes in pharmacogenomics, um, and this is unpublished data from our group in terms of all of our, this is actually all of our serious T-cell mediated drug reactions across phenotypes. And I guess what this really shows is that although there's over, over 5,000 HLA-B alleles, the same ones are coming up over and over and over again in association with these reactions. So we're seeing, and, and if you look at this list, if anyone does work in the infectious disease space, you'll notice that a lot of these alleles that are associated with bad drug reactions are also associated with protective effects from serious infectious diseases, which is fascinating, and it's probably not by accident. But we are seeing across our populations and across different phenotypes that these are the alleles, that's, the HLA-B alleles, that seem to be coming up over and over again across different drugs, and clearly in a, in a predominantly uh, Caucasian European population. <coughs> 
So in terms of in terms of roadmaps, I guess HLIB 5701 provided a powerful uh, translational roadmap for uh, discovery of a uh, marker and translation of that into routine clinical test testing. But then it didn't stop here. After the clinical testing was adopted, there was a rich science that continued to evolve that has given us profound insights into the mechanisms of drug hypersensitivity. And so I would propose. Um, an HLA genetic SJSTN translational roadmap where it actually uh, continues on a common pathway uh, until the uh, identification, for instance, of a risk allele, an HLA allele or a risk factor. But then there's a divergence that if it's actually a strong effect with a favorable number needed to test to prevent one case ratio, that this actually could be translated into clinical practice with excellent safety ratio and cost effectiveness if there's 100% negative predictive value uh, to prevent future cases of SJSTN. But in parallel to this is really understanding more about this process, more about the immunopathogenesis, the structural, biochemical, and functional relationships that we've learned about vis-a-vis -vis Abacavir and the altered peptide uh, model, but then being able to understand how drugs actually interact with HLA and the immune uh, immune receptors and the types of drugs that are actually uh, interacting with HLA and the immune receptors to create these reactions because there are common themes across these drugs. They're often uh, uh, aromatic amine uh, 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 derivatives and then being able to develop preclinical predictive models that actually can inform drug development and design. So it's like a parallel pathway at several steps along the way, uh, including preclinically, we can actually, we should be able to uh, pull out uh, risk early and actually define what the risk is and then work backwards to define what are the structural elements of those drugs that are actually um, that are actually driving these types of reactions. What are the specific structural elements? And this can be quite challenging because we often see quite subtle differences in drugs that actually de define uh, devastating effects. Um, I think in the 1960s there was a, a drug called Ivu. Uh, phenone that caused terrible hepatotoxicity, and it's only one methyl group different from ibuprofen, which we know actually quite uncommonly causes true uh, hepatotoxicity. And there are other examples where, where subtle structural differences make huge differences in terms of the propensity of a drug to cause a serious uh, adverse reaction. Um, so immunopathogenesis, I've talked a lot about this, but uh, again, we can get more insights from in vitro and in vivo studies and broader uh, issues are at play here. Uh, as Wen Hung said, this is also a, a fertile platform for defining therapeutic targets. So, for instance, if we could target granulysin uh, without severe infectious morbidity, or at least protect patients inf infectious against infections while we're actually, you know, targeting some uh, important target for SJSTEN, this would obviously be paradigm shifting, and then also predicting, uh, which includes preclinical. Uh, prediction, as I've already uh, spoken to. Um, we know with uh, reactions uh, like Abacavir hypersensitivity and, and Stevens-Johnson syndrome toxic epidermal necrolysis that the immunity seems to be long-lasting. And this is, not, this is important because it's not like this for all T-cell-mediated drug reactions. DRESS and other, uh, uh, other hypersensitivity reactions, they seem to, for, for reasons we don't understand, their immunity may not be as long-lasting, but this is an example of an Abacavir patch test, an in vivo test, where Abacavir is put on the skin, becomes positive in patients with Abacavir hypersensitivity 10 to 15 years after that initial reaction, and you can see these are gamma interferon overnight LE spots, again showing the same thing at several time points, several years after the reaction, we're still seeing robust immunological responses, and with carbamazepine, uh, the same thing happens. This is a patient that was nine years post carbamazepine TN, and again, robust uh, uh, ex vivo LE spot gamma interferon LE spot response is greater than 17 years post SGN. So the, the question is, what is actually maintaining this long lasting immunity? And I think that's sort of a, a question for, for future discovery. We, you know, we've got some theories as to why that might. Uh, be in terms of cross-reactive memory T cell responses with, uh, with chronic prevalent pathogens. Um, and this is a model that outlines uh, that, uh, that so-called heterologous immune model that would not be mutually exclusive to any of the other models that we've discussed, such as Hapton PI 
or altered peptide. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to need to wrap up here, but management I think will be discussed by other individuals, but it is a huge problem because there's no randomized controlled evidence. There's very little evidence to suggest even that, that any treatment intervention, steroids, whatever you want to uh, define, actually has any incremental benefit over robust supportive care. Um, in terms of prediction and prevention, I've talked about the translational roadmap um, and some of the hurdles on a, on a population basis and the fact that there are common drug structures and common HLA associations. Uh, the actual fact of whether something does get translated into clinical practice actually depends on a number of properties of the test, the drug, the drug toxicity. Um, and if we've got a drug like allopurinol, for instance, where there might not be another alternative or the alternative like febuxostat is much more expensive or causes hepatotoxicity in 3 to 4 percent, that may have a different connotation than a drug where there's several other drugs with, uh, with better safety profiles that don't need genetic testing. Um, this is the so-called gap between a high association and um, what might work in clinical practice, and it just basically identifies that just because a drug has a high odds ratio, it won't necessarily, you still may have to screen thousands and thousands of patients to actually uh, prevent a single case, and this becomes infeasible, just like flucloxacillin, where there's a strong association between B5701 and drug-induced liver disease, but you'd need to screen almost 14,000 individuals to prevent one case. Um, this is something that there was already a discussion about. It's the uh, Quan study from Hong Kong, and again, it just identifies effectiveness, efficacy gaps. Uh, the, the one thing we don't want to do is shift practice away from uh, from actually from, from, from one unsafe practice to another. So if carbamazepine causes SGSTN and a screening test is available, then that screening test ideally should be used and acted upon and has already been articulated. What happened in this study was that, that, that uh, practitioners got the test back and maybe even before getting the test back, they had already prescribed phenytoin. And so there was actually an increase in phenytoin SGSTN which offset uh, any decrease in carbamazepine, SJST, and, and you can see that represented in terms of prescriptions uh, on, this, uh, on this graph here. And so we really would want to actually provide providers, again, with the education and confidence to, to do that. I think just to offset this with the abacavir example, um, really the reason why this worked with abacavir, why abacavir was adopted reasonably early and was effective is the fact that practitioners could reality test it worked. So carbamazepine is a diffuse drug, it's prescribed by a lot of different people, TEN is rare, it, you'd, have to tr you'd have to treat thousands and thousands of patients to be convinced that you are preventing SJSTN in your population. A busy HIV practice within two weeks, you would start to see that a back of your hypersensitivity is going away through screening. So that's what this happened here in these observational studies. You just saw it disappear. Um, so I just wanted to perhaps end, and maybe we can move into the discussion period now to think about how are we going to achieve these objectives with SJST and think of this from a SWOT uh, type uh, analysis, thinking about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, um, and you know, really, um, because you know, for those of us in the in the room that have been in this field a long time, sort of, it's like wheels and, and roundabouts. I think we'd really like to be committed to a strategy that would move things forward, a, a timeline, a strategy. What what can be done to really make something effectual in terms of uh, translational SGST and research? You can see from the preceding talks. Um, that an enormous amount has been achieved, but it's really a question of, uh, of sort of having a, uh, a vision and a, and, a, and a timeline moving forward. Um, so I, I thought I'd just open it up for discussion, Terry, if that's okay. Yeah, well, we, we may have some questions about your talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. <laughs> I have an eighth question. How come that they're so you MHC typing in European cases? There's almost none. Is there, there's no association or the work was not done? Most of the data is on Asian patients, right? In terms of, in terms of MHC SJST, association, yeah. yeah, class one association. For, for which drugs? Well, for any drug. I mean, there's 
Well, I, I mean, not... I, think, I think there's been a lot of work across different syndromes. I think the associations, um, uh, the fact that anticonvulsants, aromatic amine anticonvulsants, uh, were, you know, one, commonly prescribed in Asia, and two, the allele that is actually, the risk allele is actually prevalent in Asia, 10 to 15 percent. It was just a convergence of, of those two factors. But the same was seen in European populations with abacavir hypersensitivity, where that association, 50, you know, 5701, one of the first associations between a drug and an HLA class uh, 1 allele was defined in a predominantly European population. So, I mean, it, it somewhat have, has to do with the fact that in early on, you know, for, for drugs and for, you know, devastating diseases like SJSTN, it was recognized that this was more common in Asian populations and Southeast Asian populations. And that is a huge clue uh, when you pair an immune reaction with uh, a, a racial predilection. That is a huge clue that there's going to be an HLA association. And I think once that was recognized, then more and more of these studies were being done. And there have been, you know, other GWAS studies like the flucloxacillin 5701 that clearly, again, that was a European story. Yes, Stephen. So I, I think that's true not only for, uh, for drug-related diseases, but for other diseases that are clearly HLA-associated. Uh, for example, uh, uh, celiac disease and dermatitis and pediformis uh, associated with, the, with B8. You don't see B8 in Japanese. You don't see the disease in Japanese, the typical disease. I, I enjoyed your talk very much. Many of the points, uh, most of the points I agree with. I think the most challenging and we've talked about this through initiatives that uh, that uh, Terry has led, is the penetration into the educational aspect, the educational dimension of what needs to be done. People just, this is not in the armamentarian of people. So uh, the penetration certainly has to be at the medical schools and the medical centers and at the residency programs <laughs> because it's much harder, as you say, when you have a diverse population using Tegretol, much harder to educate them when you know that the frequency is so infrequent. So one of the challenges, I think, is really the penetration, and this is true uh, from in many areas of medicine, but this in particular because this was not a part of the armamentarium of uh, most of the practitioners, at least in this country, for uh, generations. So there it, it has to be some uh, 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 approach, and maybe Terry wants to talk about it, but there is an approach in terms of education of uh, uh, physicians in terms of, of the use of uh, genetics. Well, maybe maybe I will comment on that if you don't if you don't mind, and and uh, and actually I'll, I'll might refer to Mark in my in my response. Um, one wonders how many things one can stuff into the brains of medical students, residents, and physicians, and, and a lot. They're a smart. lot. Yeah, they are. They are indeed. Um, and and then how many of those that they'll actually retain over over time. Um, and and while it's it's wonderful to see Neil at your hospital, I was amazed as well that the residents were saying, you know, this person should be tested for this for this allele. Um, there may be maybe automated ways that we can get at this um, within you know smaller medical care systems as as is being you know um, uh, done within Taiwan if you can flag that somebody has this variant and and if you had uh, a system for sort of universal prescribing and dispensing of drugs where this drug was not given out until there was a clearance that the patient didn't have that allele wouldn't that be great now that's not a simple thing to do I think if you put it on the board exams it would get into the medical schools I think you're right. Mark, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, uh, resistance is futile. Um, that, that, that educational approach has been, there's plenty of evidence to demonstrate it won't work. Um, and uh, we, we know this. We need new ways to do it, which, you know, involves leveraging electronic health records, point of care, just-in-time education. And I want to try and tie up a couple of different things uh, and bring it back to a, a point uh, that I think um, is really critical in terms of a research gap that we haven't addressed at all. So one of the reasons why this is challenging in countries like Canada and the United States is because uh, the allele frequency is so low that there's really not a uh, justifiable case for saying that you should be doing screening. And 
uh, you know, the point that was made, I think, by Elizabeth was that, um, you know, you can you don't know necessarily what somebody's ethnic background is just by either taking a history or 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 looking at them, and so we don't know who in this room is carrying these risk alleles, and so what that raises the question for me is, um, is what is the role as we move into the world of sequencing uh, as opposed to one-off testing, um, can we in fact solve the problem that we currently haven't solved of using massively parallel sequencing to define HLA types? Because if we did that, it would really resolve a lot of issues uh, as we move into more and more sequences. I mean, in our system at Geisinger, you know, within two to three years, we're going to have 250,000 exomes on people. And if I can get HLA information out of those exomes, then I can know before anybody prescribes a drug who's at risk, can set up the best practice alerts within the electronic health record to let people know, wait a second, we think you should do something different here. Uh, we can educate them at the point of care related to that. Um, and we can then begin to answer some of the big questions that we can't answer now, which is, uh, you know, what is the real risk? Because if we can do what Josh is going to present later, which is electronically phenotype for adverse drug events, and we have these large collections of data, uh, that we can then, uh, we can do the association studies way easier. So, but this is the rate limiting step right now is that we can't apply massively parallel sequencing to define HLA typing. So I would identify that as a very high priority for a research agenda to solve that problem, because I think we could move forward a lot faster. And to, just to throw in a few comments, um, and I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget, so I have to read them. But j just about the educational aspect, if we did have a system, however fast it turned around, et cetera, that was in hospitals, whether in patients or in academic clinics, at least residents would be exposed to the, the question and the relevance of testing or not. But I think Elizabeth's right. After you see a lot of negative tests, even when we started talking about anticonvulsant toxicity in the 1990s, neurologists would say, oh, I've treated thousands of patients and I've never seen that. There's lots of places in the world I've never seen, but I believe they exist. <laughs> and I, it just always bothered me that that was the attitude. That is a challenge. The negative impact of testing is quite strong. That one, you've perhaps labeled a person, and we now know that penicillin and allergy is not a benign diagnosis. People end up with all kinds of drug resistance and is well proven. So we'd like to disprove that. Are we creating a new group of so-called penicillin allergic people by saying you have a certain HLA gene? On the other hand, there is a safety aspect, and I would question, and maybe you, Mark, like if you were going to get carbamazepine, would there be a little bit of you inside you? You just wouldn't mind being tested. To say, yeah, so, I mean, he's nodding. So, you know, I think it's something that if you sort of know enough, you would probably want to do it. But it then comes down also to this increased complexity and cost. And patients would say, well, can I get this? So what drug could you give me where I don't have to be tested? It'll be cheaper. It'll be faster. Just give me that one. And, and what they're doing is wandering away from the known universe into the unknown universe, saying, no, I'd rather be in an area, which is basically where you get to with natural products, is the world of the unknown. You say, I want to get closer and closer to the unknown. More information is scary to me. I don't want more information. And there's a real aspect of that. So just my bottom line for that, what we had hoped for many years ago when we started doing genetic in vitro studies was that if you had the Phillips list there of HLAB, genes, and you could just be tested for that at birth. And then we learned how to manage that information. It would be done, let's say. And, and you would know. You'd say, okay, well, look, I, here's what we've learned. Or you follow those people or a cohort of those people in a control group, and, and you see who's better or not. But there may be ways of doing this at a population level that is not impossible. are sometimes marked by a single SNP. So 5701, for example, is marked by a single SNP in, down the road from HLA-B. For alleles like that, it's very simple. If you had a list of alleles, you know, you could very simply, without typing HLA, identify the people who are very likely to have B5701, for example. I don't know if there's one for 50, 1502. 1502 is at least 16 SNPs, is my understanding. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a good. I mean, we've done um, you know some work with that at Vanderbilt recently in terms of imputation, and you know, I think in particularly in European populations and uh, increasingly more racially diverse populations, it seems to be um, it, it seems to be you know a reliable strategy. Um, I think I you know, and I and I like the idea of upscaling sequencing approaches. Um, I, th I think where we're going to be with this, so I think, you know, the, the sort of single allele, single disease associations are not, are not going to be so common. There's going to be diversity across races. There's going to be complex uh, associations. Um, and I, I, th I think really the future is still going to be in what ultimately is the immunopathogenesis of these reactions. If we can actually identify the populations at risk through HLA, realizing that there's this huge gap, a, a, a large number that actually carry the risk allele will not get the disease, what is actually explaining that? And are there other, is it, are there other sequencing strategies like T cell receptor sequencing um, that we need to be pursuing in, in order to actually really define what the population of risk is across potentially different HLA alleles? Because you know, with SJSTN, I think the, the results across, you know, specific populations have been quite clean so far. But if you look at nivirapine, for instance, nivirapine dress, there's maybe about six alleles and a couple of protective alleles, and it's really diffuse, you know, uh, and it looks like that's probably going to be the rule rather than the exception. So I think we, we need to be ready with robust bioinformatic tools and, uh, and very sound and progressive uh, science to be able to tackle this problem. So, Elizabeth, on an, an unrelated topic, um, I thought it was really interesting this idea that um, these the alleles that are involved in hypersensitivity, drug hypersensitivity, um, seem also to be involved in protection against um, viral infections. And um, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to what you think the the mechanism could be. That, that there's a relationship there, if, if that relationship is real. What could the mechanism be that an allele that's involved in drug hypersensitivity, on the other hand, is involved in protection against HIV? Yeah, I mean, well, there's other differences with those, those types of alleles in B5701, and there's been a lot of work, for instance, with B2705 and ankylosing spondylitis, looking at uh, early and, and restricted responses, and there's evidence with those alleles that they do tend to sort of make, they do have, tend to have a restricted repertoire um, of peptide repertoire early on and tend to recognize more things as, as foreign, and that's sort of part, of part of the control. I mean, it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but certainly the Yank spond um, story has has evolved in that direction, and uh, you know, in terms of issues of immunodominance and what drives immunodominance with those alleles. So I guess it's you know it's that's that's sort of one one theory. The other theory uh, could be that there are other sort of more prevalent pathogen effects that apply to both systems, so that cross reactive memory T cell responses that help fight an infection also will be bad for a drug. So, you know, for cross-reactive, for instance, in theory, cross-reactive memory T cell responses to a herpes virus that may help fight HIV would not be good uh, in the setting that of a development of a neoantigen with a drug. Caroline first, and then you, gentlemen. Sorry. So, um, I, I mean, I think this is a really good, you made a really good point that, you know, we're moving past sort of a simple, single you know, gene single phenotype, and we need to get a little bit deeper than that. When you were talking about sample sizes and the ability to use small sample sizes, though, you were really sort of focusing on that simpler case. And I know it's just a matter of power calculations, but can you talk a little bit to what types of samples and what types of designs would be needed to get at these slightly more complex questions? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think at, at, at the present, I think it all starts with the uh, it all starts with the with the phenotypes, um, you know, being both the clinical and the immunological phenotype, and so the ability to actually, obviously, make sure the cases that you have are true cases, obviously, does narrow down on your sample size, so you're not having to deal with a lot of noise uh, outside of that. But I think I think the the, the uh, JAMA study that uh, that Wen Hung presented was a beautiful example of how you may not see you may you know the actual a, a, a reasonably important uh, 
effect may not be seen until you actually hone in on, uh, on, you know, on a different approach. And in, that, in the case of phenytoin, it was very important to actually uh, to have the GWAS information to actually identify the drug metabolizing uh, genotype that actually then filtered down into, uh, into the HLA risk. Um, and I think, so we, I think having approaches like that, given that we're now in a, in a state of paradigm shift where the so-called idiosyncratic dose-independent reactions of the past are now dose-dependent um, and, and genetically predictable, we have to sort of keep an open mind in terms of other effects that we might need to, uh, you know, that, that might need to be recognized. So, so there's several different layers of phenotyping, I guess, and that last example is a good an example where if you actually hone in on the uh, drug metabolizing population at risk, then you're likely to find a lot more pearls buried in there in terms of the people that are actually at risk to get phenytoin. And it might not be restricted to B1502 in Southeast Asians. And, you know, may maybe Wen Hung, you can, you can comment to that. Uh, as well, and because I think that's a very nice example in terms of the CYP2C9 star 3 group. When you actually look at that group um, and you, you see B1502 in some but not all of them, what do you actually, what do you actually see? Yeah, in, in, before we publish the result, there are many doctors in Taiwan, they, they, they did perform the B1502 before prescribing phenytoin, although the phenytoin they look not strong association. But uh, in, in clinical, many doctors, because it, the, the information will be labeled in the packets uh, of phenytoin. So, it, uh, so the, now the doc, many doctors, they, 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 they indeed prefer the genetic test of 1502 for phenytoin, but the, in reality, is that the disease cannot prevent by only genetic marker. So, uh, if we, we want to uh, have a successful pharma uh, applying to the clinic, we need to know how is the trends of the, 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 the real link to to the drug specific association, and and then also, and also the 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 positivity value, negative behavior, or the, or the number need to be tested. So there are several issues considered uh, before we uh, push our effort to to uh, for to push the doctor to 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 do the genetic test before the prescription. So phenytoin, um, and after we 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 found uh, actually the the between only part of the risk factor we. Uh, doing the dual study, we also find that, that if we come back to to a beer, then the, the sensitivity, so called, can protection of the pain tone stimulant joint, you know, they can uh, as high as sixty percent, although not one hundred percent, but I think it's uh, good enough. Uh, uh, it's better than before. We that just uh, prescribe drug and take the risk to within patient diverse stimulant joint you know. I think there are several. Uh, um, uh, effort we need to uh, to do. Uh, uh, it's not so simple. It sounds easy, uh, but uh, it's not so easy. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to uh, go back to one of the issues that was um, raised by uh, uh, Mark and Neil, and, and that is uh, one of the concerns I have is how high the bar seems to be set for determining whether um, a test has clinical value. And uh, uh, you know, I toss the question back to Mark. If you found out that you were negative for any polymorphism, whether it's uh, cytochrome P452D6 or, or uh, 1502, would that have value to you as an individual? And uh, if so, how do we include the value that a negative test might have in the uh, metric that's used to determine whether or not um, testing should be done or, 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 um, or supported? Yeah, I, this is um, a challenge because, of course, it, it really tests the paradigm of what we've traditionally done, which is population-based assessments versus individual utility. And, uh, you know, the utility for me to know my 2D6 status and my HLA status and my uh, SIP status uh, would be quite high, and I might be willing to pay out of pocket to determine that prior to uh, utilizing medications. Um, the studies that have been done that have looked at willingness to pay uh, um, indicates that people are probably willing to pay a couple hundred dollars 
for information around one specific uh, risk. And so that translates, you know, to I think what we heard from Neil about, you know, the, the cost at least for this specific test. But if I had to pay out of pocket, you know, I would be much more likely to buy a 2D6 test because of its impact on a variety of medications as opposed to a 1502, which I'm highly unlikely to carry just on the basis of my uh, race and ethnicity. So, but that's, people have tried to move that into economic valuation, and David may talk about this in his talk, about how do we measure the personal utility of this as we do our economic analyses as opposed to always modeling things from the societal perspective of cost effectiveness. But um, the implementation uh, of that is very challenging. Now, in the United States, of course, we're, uh, everybody wants their own thing. We're, we're highly uh, um, selected for that in this country. Um, but ultimately, that you know has also led to um, you know a per capita healthcare expenditures that are significantly uh, higher than uh, other parts of the country with significantly less value uh, associated with them. So we have to find some sort of a rational way uh, to do this, and that's why you know the appeal of sequencing is that your then your acquisition cost is really just an information retrieval once the sunk cost of the sequencing is done, assuming it can be done at high reliability and the information can persist. Yes. Um, yes, when we modeled the cost effectiveness for uh, genotyping for 1502 in Singapore, actually what we, we learned is that the value was more in the negative predictive value in being able to tell people that, you know, you, you've got this disease, you're going to probably need lifelong therapy, and it's very little chance if you take car carbamazepine that you'll have this reaction, and, and that was really more the economic value there. Um, I had a question for Lisbeth on, um, see, I was very interested that it's just a, s a small number of uh, alleles that predict, um, or that seem to be c keep popping up, and do you think that one strategy would might just be to have an HLA your HLA type as part of your electronic record? I mean, it's not that much information to store and keep. Or maybe, <laughs> I see Josh right, nodding his head, and I mean, we store blood type, right? So, um, I mean, just throw yeah, that no, out there. I, I think as things evolve, um, you know, I think that, that might be one strategy. I would hope that we would get to a level of sophistication where we can actually define what the gap is and and therefore provide information that's actually going to be the most clinically relevant possible, because I think w where we'll struggle with that approach is that clinicians uh, and providers already can't handle a simple yes-no um, in, in the medical record, and there is not 100% compliance even with very simple algorithms, and maybe Josh will, will talk to this a little bit with the predict models that have been set up at Vanderbilt. Um, but I think if you put, it, it's just not an area that's out there in, and widespread knowledge enough. I think that, uh, that it would be difficult in its current shape and form uh, to, be, to have widespread clinical uptake. I think we've seen some of the challenges um, associated with, with using HLA markers that way. Um, you know, I'd mentioned the back of your example where it was a reality f test for physicians in, in clinical practice, and that's that's the primary reason that that took off. If you start dealing with HLA alleles, you know, people can't keep the, the nomenclature straight. You know, when we test medical students, you know, and they'll be saying, you know, I don't know if they've copied someone else's paper, but they'll be saying it's beef, you know, 1702 associated, you know, it'll be everything but the right allele that's, that ends up being reported as being associated. And, um, I think it's hard for people to keep this information straight because it's not part of their fundamental medical education at this point. So I think we have to develop better strategies based on robust evidence. And I, I think although that would be kind of a, a dream to have all of that information in there that would improve the safety of drugs, I think it would be, it would be a big ask currently to be able to get that translated in that, in that shape and form. I think that as the science moves along, we'll be able to refine things um, to a point that there'll be better informatics, better reporting strategies, better uptake strategies, and better science to define what the actual risk is for, for these reactions. Disclose your name and affiliation, please. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, Juan Lertora from the NIH uh, Clinical Center. Uh, this has been alluded to in the previous presentations, but I wonder if you could uh, expand a bit in terms of how the uh, HLA uh, B1502 positive individuals and the population that is tolerant to carbamazepine, how is that population being leveraged in terms of further studies of uh, uh, tolerance and uh, immune mechanisms that are protective relative to the susceptible population. Right. Well, that, that's clearly a very important population, and I think a population that, um, that you know, that Wen Hung and Xuan Yu have been avidly studying. I mean, it's not a population in, in European and North American populations that we have a lot of access to. We do have some access. Um, and again, a lot of the work that's actually going on relates to specific, uh, specific TCR responses and clonotypes. So Wen Han has actually presented some of that very nice data where you could actually see uh, in their initial paper a difference that fell out between positives and tolerance. And then in their subsequent paper, really quite striking uh, results associated with a specific uh, TCR clonotype in patients in, in, in blister fluid from patients with uh, acute carbamazepine SJST. And so that, that may explain a large part of the gap, but it's still, there's probably still an underlying story as, associated with why we would actually see that. And, uh, and, and again, so one area that we're actively pursuing is, a, is the um, uh, a, a different model that actually that they, th these types of responses to drugs actually, uh, you know, that they can't, that why do they occur so quickly? You know, the latency period for, for SJSTN is pretty quick. It's like from four to four, four days to three weeks, pretty much. Uh, you know, we tend to see this on the, on the first exposure. Um, and we see memory responses that will last over several decades. And so one uh, model that we're actively pursuing is that there could be a cross-reactive response to a prevalent pathogen that's driving, uh, that's driving this. And that clearly could also explain why there's differences in positive predictive value between <coughs> drugs, between alleles, even between family members. Thank you. And you don't have any idea what pathogen is that, right? Sorry, you, you don't know which pathogen, pathogen I'm talking about. Uh, well, I mean, we, we've, got, we've got some important leads. Uh, I mean, the most, the, the, there's a, a large and rich literature on how human herpes viruses, how the human immune system has, has evolved um, in conjunction with human herpes viruses, which are clearly viruses that are laden, lie laden and dormant within us. And I think uh, that we always think of these as being villains that cause... Uh, you know, that cause horrible diseases, but in fact, there's probably an evolutionary basis for the, uh, for the development of our immune system and why those group of viruses have, have, uh, have evolved uh, specifically to become human-like, because there is a, within, uh, within the human suite of those viruses, it is specific to humans in terms of the uh, evolutionary stream. So those are the best candidates, but that doesn't mean that there can't be other uh, other examples that would occur over time, or that the actual sequence of infection that happens to us all, which is very individual, which is different between the developing and the developed world, even in terms of when we actually get our RNA versus DNA viruses, that that also couldn't explain some of the diversity and differences between populations. Yes, you argue for personalized medicine, but maybe we should look at the depersonalized approach, which is uh, why do we need a Bacvir? There are many good nucleoside analogs for HIV that, that are very safe. Take, for instance, um, flucloxacillin, which shares this susceptibility gene. We don't need that. It's not available in the United States. It's available in England, right? And uh, someone could argue that that these drugs should be replaced, and what we should focus our attention on is looking at uh, an animal model or an in vitro system to screen for this type of susceptibility and then modifying the chemistry. One of the problems with our anticonvulsants is that we're still using the anticonvulsants that were developed 70, 80 years ago. You know, in fact, Phenobarbital, I believe the FDA has declared phenobarbital ineffective, right? 
they've it's basically been marked as ineffective. So perhaps that should be the approach, which is a kind of a, kind of a chemical one, to look at how we can screen drugs. Flucloxacillin is, is very remarkable because if you look at flucloxacillin and dicloxacillin, you have to look at them a long time before you can tell them apart. There's just one little molecule, so F, the fluorine. And why is it so different, or is it different? Does dicloxacillin cause the same injury that flucloxacillin does in susceptible people? Or could we shift to uh, drugs that are safer? So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a little picture and then there's a big picture. And the little picture might be thought of as the drugs that we have right now where we can approach screening. Uh, but there may be several hurdles, as you say, to there being other drugs, other approaches that, uh, that are... Are, make make those approaches difficult, but then there's the big picture of how these same drugs have taught us so much about drug reactions. And without these drugs, the paradigm, even the paradigm shifts that have occurred over the last five years, would not have been realized. So we are continuing to learn an enormous amount about these drugs that are causing problems, like abacavir, carbamazepine, phenytoin, and allopurinol, that will drive forward preventive and prediction approaches that can then inform drug development and design, but without that, we won't actually have an approach of how, of how we're going to move forward with preclinical screening and uh, uh, strategies to actually inform drug development, because as you've, as you've identified, the, the differences are subtle. I mean, I've, I gave a couple of examples. There's a lot of differences between drugs where subtle differences make the difference between a dangerous drug and a safe and tolerable drug. So, I mean, it's, uh, but, but our science to understand that is still evolving. So we need to, we need to put resources into actually uh, moving that along uh, in, with consistency. Yes, Dr. P. Mohan. Uh, just, just to answer your question, um, so the, the, you're quite right, they are quite similar, dicloxacillin and, and flucloxacillin. Um, there are some cases of hepatotoxicity with dicloxacillin, but nobody's actually studied it because there's not enough cases to be able to do uh, HLA association studies. And to some extent, you know, uh, it could be replaced in England, in the UK, uh, but it's only historical, really. And, and unfortunately, when you have a historical setup and so on, and the drug is widely available, everybody knows how to use it, it's sometimes difficult to change its clinical practice because of that. But the frequency of that is one in five to 10,000 uh, individuals. It was just that we sort of worked together with the SAEC and Daily, myself, and so on, and we were able to collect that many samples to be able to get that uh, uh, that that uh, uh, um, kind of analysis done with the GWAS. Just to the, uh, um, also in terms of old drugs versus new drugs, if you take the epilepsy example, I don't think there's any new anti-epileptic drug which is any better than the other drugs in terms of efficacy. And most of my add-on therapies. Um, they're, they're also, even though they may not cause the hypersensitivity reactions that you mentioned that carbamazepine does, they have other problems, uh, which, which are even more difficult sometimes to actually uh, deal with. So unfortunately, uh, whatever you do, there's an equal and opposite reaction uh, to whatever you do. So it's always important to be able to look at the whole picture. Yes, over there. Some uh, threads of ideas together um, and maybe move back into the precision medicine mode as opposed to the depersonalized medicine mode. Uh, so it was mentioned, you know, exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, all these things are you know, going to be relatively routine. Uh, how do we do all this? But um, and, and does it make uh, sense from various points of view? Um, but, you know, um, if we think about just HLA, a few tens of thousands of base pairs um, and I was going to choose one region in the genome that I really wanted to know something about myself, it would be HLA. And not just for Steven Johnson's syndrome, but for all of the other drug reactions we talked about, all of the autoimmune disorders that are associated with HLA, many other diseases for which HLA pops up on genome-wide association study scans. So while not so easy to sequence, there are uh, uh, longer read sequencing uh, platforms that are coming around. Uh, not so hard to sequence a few tens of thousands of base pairs. And so when we think about what is the value, uti clinical utility of these tens of thousands of base pairs, not just for Steven Johnson syndrome, but across all of the diseases I mentioned, I'll bet you it turns into a very cost-effective exercise. <laughs>
Um, I just had three things I wanted to say. First about the um, medical school education. You know, the P450s are really hard for people to get a hold of, and there's just too much stuff to memorize. So Dave Flockhart's P450 card is a pretty simple way to get people to understand that. I don't know if everybody has seen that, but it took kind of years of understanding the different P450s and pathways of metabolism and which drugs go through them. Um, but something like that could eventually be used for, for this. Also, I wanted to say, um, oh, my name is Sally Yasuda, and I'm from the FDA. And we are very concerned with um, pushing people to the wrong drug, for example, with carbamazepine labeled for 1502. We don't want people to go to another drug that we don't know anything about. And that is very concerning for us. So I just wanted to reiterate our interest in that. And the third thing I wanted to say is that um, for a recent drug that we approved, we imposed the post-marketing requirement to um, do a genotype test for serious skin reactions. And I don't know if Mike wants to say any more about that, but that's something that we are very interested in pursuing and one way we thought we could get at it. And one thing I might ask, could you just identify yourself? We haven't been asking you. Uh, Sally Yasuda from the FDA. Great, thank you. And, and other speakers who we didn't have a chance to, to introduce, if you would please identify yourself, it would be very helpful. Could you tell us more about that uh, drug that was just approved that you, and why, what the, uh, what the rationale was in terms of, uh, of uh, asking for these post-marketing studies, particularly for skin reactions? Approved, and we knew that it had serious skin reactions, and um, we were involved in the carbamazepine labeling, of course, and we've been very interested in, in this area. So we just wanted to have more information as we go forward. So I think the study is 20, year to 20 years long, you know, in case there's a very small signal, but we just wanted an opportunity to, to pick up anything that we could. So with these, with these types of studies where patients have acute reactions um, or maybe there's some mechanism of identifying patients, I think what's really important um, and what can speed things along considerably is if the right samples are collected at the time the patient actually has the re reaction. So if we can get a system in place, not just for, for pharmacosurveillance, but actually for biobanking, getting cells collected and cryopreserved um, and, and, and DNA, uh, plasma, et cetera, at the time the patient has the reaction, then we can actually, you know, with, with, with the resources and, and tools that we've got available currently, we could probably get a pretty good idea of what the HLA association is or what the mechanism of the reaction is. That's our hope, and it's not just for Stevens-Johnson, sorry, Mark, but for dress and other serious skin reactions. And um, we are asking for genotype collection, sample collection, and a limitation of this, as you said, is this is going to rely on um, post-marketing surveillance and reporting of adverse drug reactions to the company. And I don't know. Okay, the last, the last question, please. We, we have to stop. I'm sorry. One of the issues that was raised when you mentioned Bacavir as an example where differences of prevalence have an impact on the utility of the test very clearly between different demographic populations is the experimental challenge where not only is prevalence an effect on utility, but also there's a sliding scale on the risk effect size of certain alleles in different subpopulations, as was mentioned with 1502 in Europe, for example. So in an experimental design case control study where you pool samples and you look for a difference between the control group and the exposed group, one of the problems is that you may miss out on a subset which is actually has a different kind of risk effect or threshold than another group which do doesn't. And so it goes back to the experimental design question of discovery. How will you discover a um, risk marker, let's say an HLA risk marker, if the effect size is actually not always constant because you have a mixed group of patients who have different genetic uh, interactive combinatorial effects or even non-genetic effects. Right. Uh, and, and so what actually is your thinking 
um, as you talked about how many patients you need to right. make the discovery with this challenge. I mean, I, th I think that's, that's sort of where you have more distal approaches, where you actually have patients identified that have um, a well-defined phenotype, um, and you've got drug-tolerant drug populations. Uh, but, but I guess in an ideal world, I would see things moving much more proximally. Um, and that would, in, that would include having, uh, having only a few cases, but being able to apply the, the cellular uh, techniques and sequencing to those few cases to be able to say with, with reasonable certainty that this is, I mean, if you actually identify, if you've got an allele that has a prevalence of like 20% in the population or something from that study, then you're, you're not going to be that far ahead. But if you've got an allele, if you happen to strike gold in that setting and, and it's very early in the development of the drug, only a few patients have had this, you know, terrible reaction and even only one or two cases, if you happen to get uh, you know, if you if uh, the same HLA allele with with confirmed cellular studies, and um, then you may have an answer because the t chance of getting that in two consecutive samples or two or three or four or five would actually be you know like highly improbable. So I mean, I think the the moving backwards to be able to you know I, I think with with sort of some machine learning bioinformatic approaches that we could potentially move things backward to early clinical development to start shaping what the real risk is a bit earlier before we have to get into population-based studies. Because when you think about it, I mean, no one really wants to be in a position where you're actually doing a case control study because that means that 15 to 20, 30 people would have had to have had a devastating illness to do that study. Uh, and ideally, we would be sort of moving forward with more, more intelligent approaches to be able to define these at a point where there's only very few uh, cases. So I think it's a different, you know, and this is obviously specific for SJSTN. If you've got a different phenotype of disease or a signal, you know, has been, you know, identified in a in the preclinical in in the pre-marketing phase rather, sort of like. For abacavir, where it was a prevalent syndrome, so I mean, it was identified. There were a lot of cases. It was there was a robust clinical safety program that made it still a usable drug. But uh, I think that uh, I, I think the issue is when I, you know if we're going to try and identify. There's two different questions, I guess. If we're going to try and identify uh, HLA associations to drugs that are currently on the market, where there could be an ongoing safety signal versus drugs that are currently in development, and I could, would argue for drugs that are in development that the rational approach is to try and define things as early as possible with, the, the, with the science that's moving forward. So we, we are going to have a working groups at, uh, three working groups at 4 p.m., so we have to stop here. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Great. And thank you, Ricardo. And, and just to, I didn't answer the question where the bathrooms are. So if you go out, out here to the uh, straight out and then take the first left, and they are on your left there. We will start right promptly at 1130. The four speakers for that session need to have their slides up, and we'll see you at 1130.